hopefully you'll be able to understand my Scouse accent as well, because it's, uh, it's all over. So if I end up talking about sports, it'll go all over the place, you know. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, so I just want to make sure I, I'm pronouncing it right. Is it uh, Bridget and Andrew, uh, Simek and Kingsley, is that, is that correct? That's correct. Bridget or Brigitte. Yeah, either either way, it's fine. Okay, cool. She prefers Brigitte. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. <She's> very... <laughs> work. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, but thank you both for joining me on the uh, Creative Connection podcast. And we're supported as we get started by the uh, Sudbury Indie Creature Con, uh, SICK. Uh, which is a great name, and we'll talk about Sick in just a moment. Uh, but thank you both for doing the podcast. Um, it's been really interesting <laughs> in many ways, and we'll get to why I'm laughing, and, and it just seems great why uh, the films you're making, and I, I'll, I'll, get st I'll, I'll just get started on one particular project you both worked on, and then I'm going to ask you about how you kind of both got started and how you met. Um, is it the Baby Stealer uh, that you both kind of worked on? <laughs> Because the, re the reason yeah. I the reason I mentioned that film straight away is because I've got a neighbour down the road who's who's one of the characters from the film, and just one of the kind of she's got a bit of a sadistic nature, so it's it's kind of like per <laughs> perfect timing for talking to you guys. So, um, but yeah, thank you both for for doing this. Um, how did you how did you meet, and how did this kind of creative partnership uh, start out? Well, uh, we met in university. Um, I was in the theater program and Andrew was in the film program and I had put, uh, there was in the film program, there was a board where actors could put their photos and resumes in case film students were casting. This was, you know, the internet, the internet. was just starting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, cell phones were just starting. This is a while ago. Yeah. Um, you know, is this so, like 2000, yeah, something like that. Is that 2000? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 99. 99. 1999. Wow, yeah. DVDs uh, just starting, all of that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we were uh, dating ourselves, but yeah. <laughs> the promise yeah. of uh, the home video market exploding. That was that was good times. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, her headshot was on the wall. Um, and again, no, uh, no uh, phones with cameras. So instead of writing down all the information, I tore it off the wall and was like, also so that no one else would cast her. Or their 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 films of that. That's great strategy. That yeah. The, yeah. I mean, it worked. Look at us. Twenty yeah, years later. Exactly. Um, and uh, we were. I was making a short film called Night Cries, and um, you know, cast her in the part. And um, a year, two years later, um, yeah, we just we started hanging out more, and she came to me and she was like, "Look, um, if you write a script, I'll produce it." I'll be your producer. And uh, I was like, okay, that sounds that sounds great. And then we were just two young kids with absolutely no experience and we just dove in and tried to figure out how to make a how to make a movie. Yeah. Well that that's the biggest thing, isn't it? You know, like uh, there's a lot of people have grand ideas to produce something, but if you don't actually do anything, don't get started, don't start the camera, don't start writing, it nothing's gonna happen for you and I think I'm not going to speak for everyone, but it, there's a there's an element of why aren't I getting that? You know, without actually doing anything. So, because because from yeah. from yourself, Andrew, and, and yourself, Bridget, that the creating content yourself and films yourself. I rather not say content. I rather say films. Creating films yourself is is the way is the way to go. You know, if you want you're producing stuff you want to do. Um, and you you know you end up working on other projects you know for experience and everything and um but yeah that sounds that's really interesting it's uh i i've got very similar mate because we're i think very similar ages so i can totally appreciate you know not wanting someone else to work with you thinking right oh she'd be great on you know in the film and everything and with bridget <laughs> so bridget did you offer to produce the film is that right when you first worked together yeah so well, that's that's a huge thing isn't it yeah yeah, well, I graduated and I was like, I expected to have this great acting career as soon as I graduated because I thought that's how the world worked. And then I realized how difficult it was to actually book big roles. Um, so I figured if we produced our own stuff, then we'd be able to act in it and, and have, do the characters that we wanted to do. So that was my thought process. And I've always loved business anyway. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to I'm just gonna figure it out. We, all, we, we got a lot of no's like very early on. Yeah. Like we felt like we... 
we wanted the whole cake, so to speak, right? We wanted to act in it. I wanted to write it. I wanted to direct in it. I wanted to produce yeah, it. She wanted to produce it. We wanted everything. And, and we wanted it to be $1.5 million. An, an arbitrary <laughs> number. Just hold that up. Because that yeah. sounded like a good amount sounded, of money. Yeah, to right. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, and we would, you know, we went to a bunch of established producers and they all, they didn't laugh. They all were very um, gracious to us. But they were also very much like, well, no, that's not how it works. That's not going to happen. Um, so we just decided to take one step at a time and figure out how to actually make it happen. And it took took ten years. Took ten years for that first movie to wow. um, to figure to it air. out to yeah. air to figure it out but to we, go through. We did we it made, for the one point five million. He yeah. directed, wrote it, and acted. I acted and produced. We got everything we wanted. It just took a decade. Took and in the decade. process, we ended up producing a lot of other projects to kind of learn the ropes. And, and we made a lot of mistakes on yeah. that project. Like that was probably the best um, learning experience that I've ever had. Yeah. Um, we, I understood why certain things are a certain way and like in terms <laughs> of like, oh, you're, it's very hard to do that. Um, yeah. But uh, I wouldn't change it because really like that trial by fire, um, you know, yeah. learning from learning from failing and learning from, you know, just being right there in the battle. Um, I don't think there's, there's any uh, better way. Uh, there's probably more economical ways. Uh, in other, <laughs> it sounds well, like, it sounds times. like you've, you've jumped off the cliff and gone into the deepest, like abyss, you know, Mariana trench. You sounds like that's how deep you've gone. Because it's that's how it felt. That's, for that, sure. that, that's, that's the emotional. Just think of that. Except yeah. you bought a ticket yeah. that cost you personally a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> so to jump yeah. in, yeah. So jump for the privilege. Know, so there's yeah. that kind of. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Wow, that that's great. And so, so do you think you, uh, kind of to both of you really, do you, and and obviously a little bit towards uh, Andrew, do you think that you learn steps in a slightly different way so you learn more about producing first or did you kind of have directing aspirations first and you kind of learn certain skills at the same time so was it kind of how did that work did you were you making short films before like did you pick up a camera as a young age where did you kind of interest in film uh, start for sure like i mean honestly i hate producing uh she <laughs> is a fantastic producer she she has um uh, I guess protected me as much as she possibly can. I've learned producing elements to help move productions forward just through the directing. But I'm mostly a, a director, editor, writer. Um, when you know, like I think, like any aspiring filmmaker, when they're you know um, in high school, they picked up you know there's the JVC mini DV camera, and my buddies and I would you know go out and shoot action movies and. You know, like we, we had done uh, uh, a play on, you know, like a, a Macbeth was what we were studying and, you know, in English um, class and you, you do your project and you had to do a video. So we were like, well, we're going to do a 45 minute action movie based on Macbeth and call it McBain and like it would be about <laughs> cops and all this stuff. And it was like, you know, I mean, it was, it was, you know, the early 90s. So you could get away with a lot of stuff just yeah. shooting on the street and like, you know having fun and then you you kind of realize like i wanted to be a hockey player growing up as a kid that's what i wanted to be but pretty quickly i realized well i'm just not good enough i'm not going to make the nhl and i really started to enjoy filmmaking in high school um and then that's when i you know um basically decided that this was going to be a career that i wanted to follow it was challenging i i love the challenge um went to york university and and I met Brigitte and she became my producing partner where I think we have a great, um, you know, I, I come to Brigitte with a, a ton of crazy ideas and it's like, oh, you know, this is what, you know, I want to do and, and Brigitte will do her best to find a way um, to make that happen. And then also because I know what things cost, it's just, it's also, there's a little bit of a, a back and forth in terms of like, okay, well, what skills do I have to learn to make what my vision is happen for the budget that we have 
Yeah, this so. is this is the most this is one of the biggest uh, aspects of wanting to speak with both of you, and obviously about sick, and we'll talk about it in the moment is is that dynamic that if you if you both have an idea together, if you write an idea and you want to get funding for it, how do you approach it? Is it just uh, Brigitte or is it both of you? How do you kind of go into a a pitch meeting for something like that? Well, it's no longer arbitrary. Like it's no longer a, a number that we just pick out of the sky and like, hey, let's just make it for this. Yeah. <laughs> um, like we're currently working on a new project and well, Brigitte, you can talk about like breaking down the script. And stuff. Yeah, I mean, every project's a little bit different. Like my, um, my field is very much like, I'll break it down, I'll figure out what everything's gonna cost. And then I'll talk to Andrew and I'll be like, okay, so let's say, you know, this day it's just two people talking in a room. So we can get away with a small crew, we can do this. Now this day you want to flip a car and throw it off a cliff. So That's this why day is, yeah. <laughs> we're going to need a full like stunt team and we're going to need this. So and we try to break it down so that I have a full understanding of what the cost is going to be. And once I know what the cost is, then I put in a finance plan and I try to figure out, I'm like, there's always an aspect that Andrew and I tend to finance on the passion projects. So it's like, well, how much do we want to risk on this one? And then what are the other pieces? Like, can we, have, can we find a distributor that's going to give us a couple hundred thousand? Are we going to go to, you know, the NOHFC? Are we going to, like, what's our tax credit? And I try to piece it all together. And for me, that's the fun part, really. Yeah, so for me, that's not fun at all. Because it's, <laughs> it's basically just seeing the dream. Yeah. Seeing the dream disappear, right? That's like you, true, you're right? saying, <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, well, yeah. you know, because, but um, it's, so it's definitely a... Uh, yeah, go. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was just thinking, Brigitte, when when you've kind of got an idea of what the budget might be, and is it one of those things when you look at Andrew, you think, I know his creative brain is is working overdrive. I don't want to kind of overburden him with aspects of this. It, do you kind of let him let him be creative and finish his script, or do you kind of how do you kind of approach yeah, that, well, I that try, dynamic? I mean... The most important thing to me is that I try my best to give Andrew everything he wants. If he's got toys that he wants to play with, if he, like he came up to me, he's like, I want this Mustang to drive through this tornado and I want to like build it with all of these things on it. So I'm like, so we bought a Mustang and right now it's in a shop in, in North Bay and he's doing all sorts <laughs> of things to it. And I'm, I try to give him what he wants within, you know, within a certain amount of you know, the, 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 budgetary yeah, the fact of the matter is, is that we're, we're dealing in a low budget filmmaking, you know, kind of fishbowl. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's not, you know, it's not necessarily about, you know, Brigitte saying, uh, you know, don't put any limitations on yourself. I'm already putting limitations on. I've, I've, yeah. We've been doing this, I've done, you know, over 20 movies. Like, I know the limitations that exist. It's what I'm, I, it's almost like, okay, so if we have certain amount of scenes that are smaller and we really um, put the like the showcase scenes and make them big, then it's it's almost like that's already a, a part of the creative process. I don't think I've, I've sat down and wrote a script with just unlimited, uh, you know, imagination with unlimited funds. Yeah, like Andrew will come to me and he'll right? be like, look, so I wrote two scenes with a lot of background in it. And he's like, there'll be like the scene where I want, I don't know, like 50 people running around. And and then I, and he's like, but I've written it so that it's short enough and we can put it with this other scene that's got the same 50 people. We'll just redress them and we'll maximize our day to be able to like, to do that. That's, you know. Yeah, like that, that's, that's one way where it's like, you know, it's more when you see <laughs> that scene, don't panic because yes, it's a big day, but it's, one big day with two different scenes. Yeah, so you know, we, we so. try to we, we definitely work together to try to maximize the budget that we have, and you yeah, know, some abso- some days absolutely, spend, you know, it's yeah. it's it's interesting. Like, I guess that when you see other projects and um, where you draw influences from, you think, right, how do I do that within within the means of within a potential budget? Like, uh, one of my favorite films the last couple of years, I think it was. Was it? Um, I think it was the start of COVID when it came out. Was the Invisible Man with Elizabeth Moss, and one of the things I loved about the film is the budget was small, you know, compared to like these giant movies. And the one of the stars of the show is the house they shot at, and you could tell from a producer point of view because it's on this cliff face. It's it's like an amazing location. 
uh, like a producer behind the scenes brain of mine went all oh, right okay you can see how they maximize the shooting time and you know with everything being shot at once at different locations yeah. to and it's you know it's it's the smart and that must be something you admire about brigitte is uh is the smarts you know in terms of being able to get those things and and one oh, one absolute, yeah. absolutely yeah it's something that I, one of the aspects of uh, your dynamic, which I'm really fascinated by, is do you get any separation from the work at the end of the day? Obviously, it's like at least five days a week when you're working on something, you know, you're both producing and directing. How do you kind of, do you have any separation from it or is your brain literally in overdrive until you've finished? I think like I mean, we enjoy the work so much yeah. that even when we're not specifically working on something, I'll be like, my brain will be on development or I'll be writing a script and Andrew will be like, you know, going back to past projects and color timing things or, or learning, learning, learning more new. skills. Like we're very, you know, I mean, it's not like it's the only thing that we do. We're huge New England Patriots fans. <laughs> Sunday is for football. You know, so it's like we'll sit down and enjoy football. Sometimes we'll be writing at the same time, but like, you know, um, I'm trying to get her into hockey, but it's a little tougher, <laughs> tougher, tougher, tougher sell. He gets uh, one yeah. sport. It's football. <laughs> it's like it's there like my go. um, it's like my my wife works for the NHS uh, in the UK, and uh, I'm based in the northwest in like Liverpool, Manchester, that area, um, and since uh, since we've been married my wife is in, been indoctrinated into supporting liverpool football club so it's like she she really supports them now i'm like through osmosis i'm like you have to support this team you know um and she lived she lived in manchester which is like two worldwide just massive teams and his sister was a you know a yeah. different supporter so yeah you've, you've got to have you've got to have very similar supporting um allegiances otherwise it can be real friction you know oh well, we we as we had to go through Tom Brady leaving the Patriots to play for another team, so yeah. I kind of gave us a pass for a while. The, you know those three years that he played, <laughs> but not, but you know since he retired, I was like, okay, but you know Bridge, we're now we have to only cheer for the Patriots, <laughs> and she's just like, well. I kind of like this Joe Burrow out of Cincinnati. I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not how this works. We're, 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 we're past guys. We're past guys. <laughs> so, yeah. Slash Bucks fans. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. it, isn't it? Which is yeah. which is the kind of um, which is the one team in sport that you like? That if you cut if you cut your arm, you bleed that color. Which which team is it? It's the Patriots. It's the Patriots. Patriots, yeah. yeah. It's the same with me with Liverpool. I, I'll, that's just until I die. My, my family's split down the middle, Man United, so it's like real rivalry and bloodshed, you know. Not real bloodshed, <laughs> but just kind yeah. of sport-related. Um, I wanted to ask you I, I would say that... Just go, no, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, before, you know, Patriots, I would have obviously said the Toronto Maple Leafs, but they've taken so much of my blood that... <laughs> I can't, yeah, I can't do it anymore. It's painful, painful. Yeah, um, I want painful. to ask you. Yeah, I want to ask you both individually. How did you, um, when you were growing up as kind of young kids, um, where did your interest in cinema and film begin? Was it a family member? Was it a friend? Did you go to cinema off the theatre, cinema often? Where did that kind of both start for you? Um, for me, I mean, I. I had an uncle who was in theater and film and he lived up north and I went to visit him one day when I was probably 10 or even younger and I went on a on a movie set and it was a small independent film and I remember seeing the cameras and the lights and like their life seemed so exciting um, and I had always loved the idea of acting so from that point on I was like I'm just gonna I'm gonna be an actress and it was just something I loved from a very young age yeah. yeah for me like um growing up in the 80s with the 80s movies um my first theater experience that i remember there's a there's a theater in um like ontario place it's called it's it's cinesphere and they used to it, it used to be only one of the few places that would actually show imax movies this is back like they did a lot of nature you like know, the dinosaur nature. in in space and all yeah, that like, yeah or like underwater like it was you know giant well the first movie that i remember going to see in the theater specifically at that was the empire strikes back and that's a good that start. movie had such an impact 
Yeah. <laughs> that impact had such, you know, that movie had such an impact on me. You know, the good guys lose, you know, the greatest reveal in movie history at the time happens, you know, and I was just like floored. I, I couldn't stop talking about it when I got home. And then, you know, also growing up with the Back to the Future movies, like Spielberg's Prime in terms of like all the, you know, the the Hollywood, um, you know, like the, the Amblin movies, like that, that all came out at that time. And Star Wars, like I said, had a huge impact on us. Um, and then, you know, going into high school, Tarantino came out and then it was like, oh, that was the newest cool thing. And my buddies and I, we would just love chatting about what he was doing in cinema because it was different. And I think a lot of it with me, it was, it came from the love of those stories. Like I, I loved to read the Hardy Boys as a kid and then kind of getting into those Amblin uh, style of like, the, you know, they're all romance movies. They're all like at their heart that that's what they are, even though they're adventure movies. They're like that, that's opera, you know, the soap opera movie yeah, absolutely. that I loved. And then Tarantino kind of changed that in terms of my viewpoint. And But really loved the camaraderie on on sets of, you know, working together. Yeah. It was never an alone thing with me. It was always like, we were always part of a team. And then, you know, that, that end of the day of even shooting on those, you know, crappy video cameras and you're watching your footage with your buddies and going through all that like look what we were able to accomplish and look what we were you know look how fun that was doing it it was like that was kind of the moment where i was like oh i really you know if i couldn't be a part of a sports team i, I wanted to be a part of this team yeah and um that just really appealed to me and and storytelling has always appealed to me so it just kind of made sense i think that that's probably like a similar thing with supporting your teams as well sports and that kind of dynamic of the team and camaraderie and you know like i was speaking to a stunt performer on the first episode of the show a podcast uh, alex chung and he, we were talking about john carpenter's movies and we both mutually absolutely love his films and his 80s stuff is is just incredible and when you watch something like the thing you know with kurt russell in the snow and it's the dynamic of the it's not just the camaraderie of the production crew, it's the camaraderie of the characters on the film that I, I love as well. You know, like the Goonies, the team banding together to solve a, oh, to solve a crime or, you know, it's, you get, you know, you, you want to be one of those people. And that was, that was the biggest kind of love for cinema I had as well was I wanted to be one of those characters on screen. And yeah, mm -hmm. it's, um, yeah, my, my kind of background is editing and um, I, I was a production runner on Band of Brothers years ago and I did a few bits. Oh, really? Yeah. That. yeah, it was like a, friend, a girl I really fancied. That's how most things start. Um, she <laughs> she said, it's true, isn't it? It, it She said to me, really? oh, do you want to you you come and work on this thing? I think it was 99, middle of 99. And she said, oh, it's this thing called Band of Brothers. Okay, that's, uh, I don't know what it's about, it's a war thing. No one knew anything about it because it's been shot in all, all parts of the UK. And then I ended up working with like Dexter Fletcher and um, Michael Fassbender was on set. You know, the cast is, on, when you watch it again, yeah. the cast is oh, another really? level. Yeah. Um, and then it was little little bits See, here I'm, and there. See how hard he is? <laughs> I know, exactly. It's so odd. He was interviewed on a, on a TV show, a breakfast show in the UK years ago. And he was like a rake, and now he's like you know, yeah. he's Bane, isn't he? You know, he's always like that. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's it's really interesting to see how he gets started, and um, I could sense the um, the eighties vibe and influence on uh, Rock to Pussy. We'll we'll touch on that in a moment um, on the artwork straight away because it felt like Flight of the Navigator or something like that. You know, in terms of the art, so I'm a huge, uh, a huge uh, Drew Struzan fan of oh, the poster legend, work yeah. from the eighties. Like yeah. he's the best, right? So um, it, I didn't paint it, but creating the artwork was very much a painstaking Photoshop process of trying to make it resemble as much of a Drewster's Zen uh, painting, as well as like, you know, I remember like the art of uh, Boris Vallejo really was an influence for Rock the Pussy as well in terms of, you know, that uh, the, the, the Conan look, the, you know, the... Uh, yeah. Um, the the you know the, the stuff that you would see on those uh science fiction magazines at the corner store it has it has this like it has this it. 80s magic sprinkled on it that poster of your mm -hmm. film it yeah. really does so <laughs> yeah. um one thing i wanted to ask you about as a dynamic of the two of you obviously it sounds 
like a fantastic kind of working uh, relationship but it how do you get past do you ever you must have had clashes on creative things or production and how do you kind of get past those things no, I mean, I think the beauty, like why we're so lucky in this partnership is that when it comes to creative things, even if we might not see eye to eye a hundred percent, like it, it will always defer to Andrew. Cause I feel like he's got the creative side. Like he knows so much more than I do. And then with the production side, again, like if there's something where we're not a hundred percent sure on, like Andrew will defer to me because it's more, and we, we sort of trust each other in those two fields. Um, that's like, we both take each other's, um, advice, advice very seriously. Like there are, there are times where, you know, when I'm directing the way, the way I feel, it's like, you're the captain of the ship. Right. And sometimes that ship is heads for stormy waters and you, and you can't necessarily see the way out, but you're still the captain Yeah, and you have to kind of, you know, be in charge of that. So sometimes, sometimes uh, I can be wrong. Um, just, just from this, you know, the state of that. And you know, there'll be times where Brigitte, like after the day, will be like, "Oh, I was thinking that you know this might have, have worked." I was like, "Well, why didn't you tell me?" I was literally in a <laughs> monsoon at the moment, you know. Yeah. And she's like, "Well, you know, I know I didn't want to, you know, overstep." And it's like, "Well, um, we're like she's now written how many movies as well?" Eight. She's written eight scripts now, right? So, um, I, you know, when when she comes to me with uh, a script, um, I'll edit it and we'll work together. But we're very much similar because we've been working together for uh, you know over twenty years now in terms of our mindsets, in terms of what yeah. you know what we want to see, what uh, a, the structure should be, and also like. The, you know, when we're doing a passion project, the structure is far different than when we're doing, you know, like, yeah, uh, and, and I'd say whenever I'm doing something creative, like everything that I've learned, I learned from Andrew. So when I come to him with the script, I 1000% trust his input, you know, I'll be like, Hey, I don't know how to fix this. Or, Hey, can you have a read and see where, where I'm going with this? And then he'll, uh, his advice is always you know, really strong and really great. And I trust it. So, well, I also understand the creative process where sometimes you don't necessarily want to, you know, like if, if the structure is not working here, it's, it's, I think the, the thing that I've learned myself, um, over the years is that, um, the story, you know, there was a lot of times earlier on in my career where there was a lot of scenes where I just loved the scenes, fell in love with the scenes and couldn't lose them. And over the years, I've really, come to realize that the, you know, I say quite a bit, the, the story can bend quite a bit before breaking. And since story is everything, I kind of, that's now my, my through line. So, um, you know, on this last script that Brigitte was working on, you know, I kind of was like, well, this scene doesn't work. She's like, I love that scene. I'm like, (laughs) yeah, but if we're only focusing on the story, it's, it's muddying up way too much. Um, Kill your darlings is what he says. Yeah, I guess. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, sometimes you know, sometimes that's what you know is, is needed. So, no, like I think that um, overall, uh, we're we're very respectful of each other's mm-hmm. positions. But um, like I've been trying to slowly, you know, suggest to her that she should start directing as well. So I'm I'm also like. I think that when you're stagnant and you stop learning new, having new experiences, yeah. um, I think that hurts. So, you know, I remember, you know, years ago, I was like, you should write and now she's writing. It's like, well, you should direct and now she's, you know, now, you know, hopefully next couple of years she'll be directing. Um, <laughs> you know, it's one of those things where uh, I think it's important for the creative process. And then when you're in those shoes, you kind of understand better as you know, like I can, I, when I was an editor, I understand directing better. When I was, you know, um, what I like to do, like, because we work in low budgets, I like to know uh, all aspects so that when I'm asking someone to do something, I know what I'm asking them to do. Yeah. Right. So whether it's set building or set design, I, I you know, really early on, I, I took a, um, a really interest in like, how is it actually made? 
so that I can say, well, when I'm asking for this corridor to be built, I want to know what it takes because I want to know the price and I want to know what the labor is. And, and if someone, you know, can't make it that day, I can fill in and finish the job. Right. Which is, you know, kind of, um, I've, uh, I've got a know, great important. No, I totally agree with that. And you become savvy with everything and you know what you, how you can, how budgets can shift and you have a great run. So like you say, learning is learning is everything. And you just keep, keep learning. Um, I've got a great little story that I think you'll appreciate. Um, uh, this relates to uh, Spielberg's production designer, Joe Alves. I interviewed him for the Hellbound Horror Festival, which I started a couple of years ago. And I, um, he became one of the judges on the on the, the festival. It was short films being submitted, horror films. And he was amazing to talk to. We talked about Escape from New York, creating the shark for Jaws, all the problems and Close Encounters nomination for an Oscar and all of that. And I asked him, I asked him with about everyone he worked with. And one of the people he worked with was Hitchcock. And he, the production designer of, or art director at the time, that's what the, that the role was called. Uh, he was, he was ill and Joe had to take over and he had to build this set. And Paul Newman was going to come onto the set and, um, and Julie Andrews was a big scene. And he, obviously he was still, he had experience already but he was so used to having a larger budget, like a much larger budget. So he started construction on this corridor, on this whole room and the height and everything. And, you know, you can put the camera right. anywhere. And then, but Hitchcock came to yeah. him and said, what it is kind of, I won't do the Hitchcock's accent or anything. Um, but he approached Joe and said, Joe, what are you doing? We don't need this. Uh, and then he said, oh, well, I thought you wanted to No, the camera's going to be here. And then he showed him how he directed and now we're only going to see this part of the set. So that's all you need to build. Um, so obviously it takes a lot of discipline yeah. to to understand that. And, you know, props to you for, you know, it's, it must be something that, you know, you, you kind of continue to appreciate the skills and talents of other people and trust. And that's something I kind of wanted to talk to you both about that, you know, with the two of you being so close and, you know, so creative, that... I take it that extends to crew and cast as well that you've worked with. Cause I noticed that you work with, um, Sarah, uh, Mitich, um, a couple of times and, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, I kind of, can you touch upon that? How, how do you grow your kind of production crew and what's it like in that dynamic working with recurring kind of, uh, actors? Um, I mean, from both crew and actors point of view, it's like, we, we run a set that's very um, non-stress. Like there's no, we, we try to run it that's family oriented and no stress. So it's like personalities have a lot to do with it. So when people come to work with us, we tend to try to mentor people that we think are, you know, are good and have good work ethics, but that are also just good people that enjoy making movies, um, you know? So if that's what we find, then they tend to come back over and over again in our crew. I mean, it's usually, 90% the same people. <laughs> Every yeah, once in I a mean, while, people look, I mean, you know, the, come and go. With, with budgets like this, a lot of times we're working with um, new people, like new crew members, like first times on set, second times on set. And that first time was probably with us, you know? So, <laughs> um, yeah. you know, it's, it's about, um, I think like it's kind of changed since when we started. I think now, like technology is so different from when we started, right? Like massive. just yeah, the, massive. the, massive like that that and that has a huge that has a huge impact on crew like it, it, it you know and the discipline and and the, to be honest like you know phones as well phones on set is like kind of like it's a disaster it's you know, it's, it's just a, a consistent, it, consistent like everyone's looking at their phones like this it's it's a different time where it's like you're trying to mentor like I always try to mentor filmmakers and like, you know, if you love film and like trying to, um, you know, have you present as much as possible. Um, and I always tell my crew crew that it's like, you know, the moment that you can't do one of my projects and you're onto something bigger, I mean, that's the happiest day. It means you've kind of, you know, graduated sort of from the school that we, you know, because and it's, you're being you know, proud, our, you're proud crew, as well, aren't you? You're proud of them. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, I mean, our crews are, are generally very small. Um, like I said, everyone knows everyone on it because you can't. There's like, you know, 
max 30 of us, you know, the max, max, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's been times like, I think night cries, um, was another passion project where we didn't have a huge budget, but, um, we had, uh, make, well, makeup, um, production design, uh, and camera and sound. And that was it. We didn't have a focus puller. It was, we had used, there was a technology called the Red Rock um, Micro. I, I know like it. On the hand. I, I, I absolutely know. Yeah, getting focus for that yeah. can be a nightmare if you've not got the right setup. And yeah. All that, so and yeah. Um, and uh, it was, the look was more along the lines of, um, you know, Peter Berg's Friday Night Lights that was like kind of snap in and out of focus. So that was yeah. like the plan that we could, we could do that. Um, and my uh, DOP at the time, Joshua Freeman, like he just he did such a great job with it. But I remember, you know, Brigitte and I, it's one of the projects that we were acting opposite each other. And that was it. Like that was the entire crew for most of the days. Um, and, you know, I would be adjusting my own lighting, right? Um, like and taking your eye off the viewfinder and yeah. Yeah, you know, so it was just, it was just one of those things where um that's sometimes as small as the crew gets and sometimes you know in that same project we had there's a scene where uh, you know there's a uh, i'm fighting a demon in a fight pit and there was you know i would say 30 backgrounds three stunt performers you know a stunt three riggers, cor- three riggers <laughs> like and then that's kind of like Probably that 10, yeah 10, crew. yeah like it it can go from anywhere from five people to 30 people on our crew. I think the balance is just trying to get the pro like knowing yeah. if, if you have the vision for the end project, then you kind of just try to make it work with, you know, what you have in terms of, and, and that's one of the benefits of us being a small team and kind of spreading out shooting is that we can kind of, you know, sometimes, you know, you're shooting a, a movie. If you, if you look at it from the entire project, that's a lot to do. And I think maybe sometimes people, um, get bogged down in the size and scope of the movie yeah. but it like anything you can take that one step and go okay well how do i break up this movie into little shoots mm-hmm. right and then okay let's start there so we're doing these little shoots and then eventually you piece that together into the larger movie right so yeah because yeah. if you're then, if you're uh, uh, sorry sorry Brigitte, but if you're if you're literally trying yeah. to think about the entire film all the time it's going to be like that scene from Shocker where your head just explodes. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's a, it's a, and, and, you know, another thing that people always ask us too is this, like, what would you tell? This is my favorite thing. It was like, there was like what would you tell your younger self, uh, you know, like now, you know, sports, about sports making results. Movies and, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah sports, sports sports almanac. Almanac. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it, you know, we always say it's like, we probably wouldn't tell our younger selves anything because not knowing how difficult the process is, uh, really helped us, <laughs> you know, that blind enthusiasm of wanting to do it so much. Um, yeah. you know, cause it, it doesn't, I don't know if it gets easier. I think we're just used to how hard it is. If that makes sense. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, so, um, Brigitte, then... sorry, uh, from your point of view, Brigitte, what's the, um, because I can totally sense, the, you know, shooting on mini DV in late ni- late nineties and tape yeah. and playback and no, no such thing as daily as you're shooting on digital and uh, 90% of filmmakers still are, uh, are sorry. Um, what's it like from a production point of view from when you started and you first met in terms of the technology and how you as a producer have developed are the things you need to kind of keep ahead of uh, in terms of development? And do you continue to grow your understanding of the technology as well in terms of production uh, to help produce? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously the technology has changed a lot. Um, it, it's helped our budget tremendously because it's much cheaper to make a movie today than it was when, you know, when we first started. The first bit of Medium Raw was shot on 35 film. You know, like, so it's like the no playback realize yeah. that the 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 crystal sync generator for those who aren't uh, our age uh didn't match up so we had a flicker for a ton of the shots where the hmi was being used and our big star was john reese davies which we 
flew out yeah. for like three, four days and we couldn't reshoot with him at all. We couldn't reshoot with him. So it's like, <laughs> there was a lot of, yeah. you know, and because playback wasn't a thing uh, and dailies were too late because we only had them for three days. Yeah. Um, you know, that was, yeah. that just that alone, when the red won, uh, we, we started on 35, we shot those first week on 35 mil. And then we went on a hiatus because um, we spent all our money. How long was the hiatus? Two yeah. years. Was it two years? On, on okay, medium, well, that on was medium, a long hiatus. On medium roll. So, we shot in 2000. Yeah. We shot 2005 after we got married. We shot the first little bit. Yeah, and with then, the flashback. And then we shot 2007. When did we shoot with John Rhys Davies? I think 2006. Six. And then we shot in 2008, and then it came out in 2010. Yeah, so that was a long so two, <laughs> two, two years, but in that time, red, the, the red the red one came out. Yeah. yeah, and the red one was literally for independent filmmakers. Like it was, it was a godsend. Like I yeah. right now, I shoot on the like I'm a red guy. I shoot on the Red Raptor XL, their their newest like power horse of a camera, and. Um, like without red uh for us at least because this is again before ari came out with their alexis um being able to shoot that high quality um for that budget where you could buy the camera and actually like that was that was a that was a godsend for us like like that tool alone like helped us so much but now it's like you know you got you use your iphone the iphone <laughs> pro and it's you can probably make a movie with that you know so yeah it's crazy it's crazy uh, if you Absolutely have a good crazy. idea like you yeah. look at like i went to you a know. tech i went to a tech show a couple of years ago a few years ago and they were talking about lidar and it was you know the broadcast cameras they have on the side of the sports sports pitches they get the mega zooms mm -hmm. like 800 mil lens uh, the lidar technology was i think it was i'm sure it was like branded lidar in terms of the actual name of the company and the cameras were massive and they were talking shooting a pool table and the fact that you could change focus after it was recorded was absolutely insane that you know. wouldn't need a focus puller all of that very scary for you know it's like ai now it's very scary for script writers and anyone that works in the industry you know the artists or the concept art is a massive thing like alex Preuss, who i interviewed for a previous uh, podcast um he's he's showing that you know what it can do and how because he, he works in um, uh, virtual studios now. He kind of heads up a company that are, are doing that. Mm. And yeah, the technology is great, but then it's the awareness of awareness of all the tools. You've got to know what all these things do. Um, yeah, that's really yeah. fascinating that, you know, you've got to keep like keep learning. What, what's your... Learning. Yeah, I'm just curious, like what... Because, I mean, you know, growing up in the 80s and, you know, 90s with um, so much of it, like with sets being built. I mean, Star Wars right now is shooting on the volume, yeah. right? Like pretty much, you know, the, the wraparound. And I, I just can't get into it. Like it, it just feels either too clean or the, the, like the mat there's, I feel like I'm watching it and there's, I mean, look, Disney destroyed Star Wars. That's, that's a whole other conversation. I'm literally just talking about the feel and the look yeah. that, because I'm all for new technologies, but there was something about like the the art designers and the set creators who are making like the sets that you can touch for real, and then how yeah. the camera actually, you know, like maybe one day we'll get there. But I just feel like I'm watching, you know, modern day, you know, science fiction of like the the stuff that I wanted to watch as as a kid. Well, a lot, a lot's so lost, a lot's lost, um, as in like in a really in a small way when um i think dvd the thing the thing that will be lost with dvds and blu-rays when they dis sadly they'll disappear is you'll start to see less and less commentaries and when richard donner did the uh, dvd commentary for the goonies with the whole cast of the goonies it's an incredible uh, visual commentary they cut to the actors and then they go back to the audio and show the film he's talking about mm -hmm. the the kids on set when they first see the pirate ship and it's uh, like a one wondrous thing yeah. when they turn around and they fall off the slides but then Corey Feldman reveals they actually snuck onto set and they already saw the ship 
and it was like Richard Donner. Didn't know, <laughs> he didn't know that until literally when they recorded the audio podcast, uh, audio commentary, which was hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. So, like the tangibility yeah. of like being able to t- see see the wonder and and that is is fantastic. And it it there's got to be something lost in terms of a performer looking out onto a set. There has to be something lost there. Um, I think I think Matt Reeves did a great job with the Batman because some of that is layered in really well with partial sets as well. So if you do it, I think there's a balance mm-hmm. to be struck with it, you know. Um, and yeah, it's um, sometimes it's like some of that creative freedom is you've got um, you know potentially a tech assist who's not a DP choosing how the focus looks, you know, if you've got where there's, you don't have a DP, say you're doing on a budget, someone else is making a real creative uh, decision. It's very, very tricky. Um, Yeah. But yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be, it's one of those things like that's, that's something that Price, you know, Alex Price was talking about. And I was asking him about set design when he, when he built um, the dark city sets, uh, because it's an incredible film visually. It's absolutely, you know, amazing um and he says it's it's sadly it's something that's you either embrace it work with it or you you know you lose opportunities because you're not using it um but yeah um i wanted i wanted to talk a little bit about medium raw and the cast obviously there's two two cast members in that obviously and yourself as well brigitte um but william b davis Mm -hmm. how did you kind of get william b and john reese davis to be in the film um, I mean, we just, we were talking about that back then we had no fear, right? So it was just one of those things where we reached out to the agent and was like, here's an offer. <laughs> yeah. We didn't yeah. know what people and cost. We just kind of <laughs> threw numbers, threw out, there numbers and, out there. And with John Reese Davies, I mean, we finally got to a number where they accepted it. And I didn't realize this is the problem. I thought that the offer was the amount that we paid him. I didn't realize that you had to fly him, you know, first class from one island to England and then first class from England to, you know, to Toronto. And then everything had to be first class. And I was like, he cost us, I think, an extra $50,000 that I didn't expect. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, that's a learning experience. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah. it's just, you just don't realize all the fringes that come with having um, a, a wonderful, like, name actor, right? You just, because... I think my favorite story, you, I, you might have heard it, but... Um, like I said, this was like one of our first movies and, you know, Brigitte was so proud of the, you know, we had Winnebago's. We rarely have Winnebago's. We, never we, had we, Winnebago. we, had, we had a Winnebago for, uh, you know, John and uh, she's giving him the tour of the Winnebago and, and John turns to her and says, uh, oh, honey, I've been in a Winnebago before and they've all been much bigger than this one. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and I was like, he was just so great, so gracious. And I, I have so many great stories. Like I, I was so nervous. Were, uh, acting I can imagine. Yeah. Him. Like John Reese Davis, a legend. Like the night before I was puking and not, not so much about like the acting, just about like the directing too, where, you know, he's worked with Spielberg and Peter Jackson. Like those, those are like my heroes. Like the, to me, they're the, you know, among the greatest, if not the greatest filmmakers of all time. And, and I was like, there's nothing that me as like this new director could possibly ever, you know, say to him. And we were, there's a scene where there's a crime scene and we're blocking it out. And, yeah. you know, John's doing his rehearsal and he's just all over the room. And my DOP, Matt, um, Matt uh, he, uh, Brad Smith at the time, he looks at me and he's like, we can't, like, we can't <laughs> light all that. We can't cover that. We, we got like three hours and so i'm like I, you know I, I i basically you know i i give brad a a wink and i i turn to john i'm like listen john and i come up with this cockamamie story about how his character uh is feeling like he sees the crime scene that he hasn't seen in you know 20 years and he he he's more drawn aback so he's more withdrawn and john just turns to me and says andrew i appreciate what you're doing I'll stand right here. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yep, that was, yeah. you know, that was, that 
was pretty much the you know <laughs> that's incredible my, and, my um, what what was it like working with uh, william b davis as well oh he was wonderful because he he came on very last minute and he was one of the main characters and had the most dialogue um and we ended up we were uh, i think stephen mccaddy was on board for that project yeah and then last minute his agent Hold him, just hold him. Hold him. He had something else come up, I guess, or whatever it was. It didn't. Uh, it didn't end up working out, and so we had to find a replacement. And um, William was one of the people that we had really liked and thought of, and so we, we had, the, the, this movie back then. We had this list of all the people that we, you know, we wanted, always yeah. wanted, right? So John was on there, Michael Ironside was on there, you know, Stephen McCaddy was on there. Henry Cherney was on there, yeah. you know, like William B. Davis is on there, like all these, like just that's who we want. Like yeah. in this yeah. Project, Did you uh, right? when you were thinking you know, of uh, when you were thinking of Michael Ironside, were you thinking of is there a way I can cut, get his arms ripped off? Because he seems to have his arms, <laughs> his arms ripped off in everything. In everything, yeah. No, it, it's we just did you kill know, him, though, yeah. In, 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 <laughs> we, we cast him in a different pro, uh, project, yeah. but you know, like Michael had just such a. Like that, he's got that voice. Oh, right? Splinter like Cell, so much yeah. Of like, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, so when um, we got um, William on board, um, I was a huge X Files fan as well. So, um, and uh, it, at that time, you know, he had done that one episode. I don't know if you remember that had the um, uh, the Cancer Man, uh, Smoking Man uh, episode where. Um, it shows his flashback and alter like, uh, like when oh yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm a I, I'm an addict. That's another thing. If I cut <laughs> this other other arm, like the X Files spills out, yeah. you know. Right. Yeah. So I mean, like that for me, I was like, oh man, this guy's great. Um, and uh, you know, we brought him on board, and it was it's a it's a, a lot of lines. It was a lot of dialogue, and and we cast him like a week before we started shooting. Oh wow! And he came in, and he was just he was just incredible. And yeah. The, the, the fun thing, too, is like with uh, Medium Raw, um, we'll be re-releasing it. It's never been released on Blu-ray. Um, we'll be re-releasing it uh, either late this year or early next year on Blu-ray for the first time. Um, newly mastered. Uh, remastered. Newly uh, remastered uh, from awesome. the original files. And um, <laughs> a little bit of different cut, too. Yeah. Uh, I would say it's the director's cut <laughs> uh, 20 years later. <laughs> so um, yeah. look out for that because uh, it, it's been fun to kind of go back and re, you yeah. know, re-experience uh, our well, that, first. And that project was really fun because, like Andrew said, we had a list of all of the actors we wanted to work with. And some of that were, like Andrew was a big wrestling fan. So we had two wrestlers from the, from the WWE on that movie. And then we had, we were huge Buffy fans. So we brought out Mercedes McNabb. It was one of those projects where we were like, we're just going to ask everybody we want to work with. And we yeah. didn't have the mindset we did today where it's like, you think it's hard. Back then, we we're just like, well, we'll just ask. They'll say no if they don't want to. And they all ended up coming on board. And we were just like, oh, this is easy. It's like, yeah. you, you know, it, it's like that, <laughs> that, you know, when you don't have anything to lose, you don't really have fear. We yeah. didn't realize that you if know? we didn't shoot the movie, we'd still have to pay them. Whereas today, that's what stops us from putting an offer because right. we're just kind of like, well, if the project doesn't work out, we still owe all of that money. Um, yeah, like, yeah. Know, we just didn't have that mindset. That, we, we just, just didn't like, have that mindset. Because we didn't, you know, we didn't think that we could fail. Yeah, do you know yeah. what I mean. So, so when you do get say those two, you know, two wonderful actors, and do you have that initial sinking feeling like, oh God, right now I've got to really go into fifth gear and. And I, I want to knock it out of the park because, you know, you do admire them, but then you being professional as well. You want to be, you know, do a great job. Um, it must be like, it must be really gratifying from, you know, from a production uh, and a performance act, uh, an actor's point of view and a director that you get to work with these people in your kind of different, um, different ways. It must be quite gratifying. It was, it was... I don't know if I can, I appreciate it as much back then because I was so young and in the whirlwind of actually creating the movie. And it was just, it was one of the, still is one of the hardest movies we have, we've ever done, like tried to accomplish. Um, looking back on the project, um, I don't know if I was mature enough to, um, like experience, like truly experience. Like I felt so much of it was an out of body, like, 
you know, you're just, you're, you're in the battle. You're, you're just to trying to survive. We also didn't know if we'd have enough money to finish the movie. So every day was like, like, I remember when we got William B. Davis on board, we're like, great. Now we actually don't have the money to pay him. And I remember like, we borrowed money. We yeah. borrowed like a good chunk of money to pay him. And then like, as the production kept going, it's like, we we kept needing more money, but it was one of those things where we're like, we're just gonna keep shooting and we're gonna figure it out as we shoot. And so, you know, we were lucky to have an executive producer that, you know, gave us their credit card and, <laughs> and we, you know, using it. we kept using it. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was definitely one of those experiences where our lack of knowledge and our like absolute belief that this was gonna be successful is what got us through. And now 20 years later, because we know so much of the industry and we understand the rate of like things going wrong and, and all the things that you can lose, we're a lot more cautious, which I kind of miss being as ballsy as we were back then. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But uh, we're, we're a little bit more savvy. Yeah, we're a, a bit little more, more sav cool. savvy now. Yeah. 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 And, and sometimes, like I said, it's like, what would you tell your young self? Buckle, buckle up. Because it. <laughs> it's going to be, you know. You're get some, get some sleep. Get some sleep. Yeah. So you're gonna, you're gonna learn from every, you know, every misstep. And uh, like the yeah. thing is, like I wouldn't really change anything. Going back, it's like I said, they're all learning experiences, and you know, I mean, Medium Raw was probably our biggest like failure, like in terms of like we succeeded in making the movie, but like mm -hmm. you know, it was definitely our. We we swung for the fences and like just. We thought we would make a lot of money. We're like, we're going to make our first movie. We're going to make millions. And we ended up being in debt for years and years, years and like, years it, and paying everybody back. Like, we were working three jobs trying like it to was pay rough. everyone back. Like, it, wow. was, it, was, it, yeah. it was one of those things where um, it was a definite learning experience yeah. that most people would probably just go, okay, well, <laughs> that's it. That <laughs> I'm not going to try that, well, that again. That's it, isn't it? We know it's... Going. You've got to, oh, you've got to, you know, got to swing. You got to keep swinging for the fences, and you got to keep yeah. doing it, no matter what game it is. Um, that's really, yeah. really fascinating. It's, yeah, I guess you have those from your, uh, from your guys' point of view when you, when you reflect upon making that experience. That's when you can start enjoying the moments you spent with actors and producers and writers. Yeah. Um, so there's, I there's think a couple of. Interesting. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I think what's interesting is now that we are re-releasing it, you know, all of these years later, I think we're appreciating all of those moments so much. Like even the movie, I was like, oh, wow, it really stood up. Like it, it's still a really great fun movie, especially with Andrew, you know, making a few cuts and, you know, recolor timing it and all that stuff. It's, it's something we've been able to revisit and really appreciate this time around. Um, it, the way I put it, it's like, it was very like the movie that I released back then was definitely like a kid with big dreams that didn't have enough money to pull it off, but didn't know how to edit the stuff that didn't work. And that's kind of how I view that project and kind of looking back, you know, 20 movies later, looking back at that movie, being able to go into the raw footage and, and you know, re-edit a bunch of it and cut out a bunch of the stuff that didn't work. And you're like, you, you know what? There was a lot of bad in that movie. There was also a lot of good in that movie. And, uh, you know, it was kind of, it's kind of fun to see, like, as a team, like, how far, you know, we've, we've learned and, like, just look and really appreciating those, that moment in time because yeah. it was definitely a, a learning experience for, <laughs> for us. Um, for in, in that particular instance, was it, um, uh, this is like a, a bit of a technical question. Um, was it, did you have the original project files? Was it on digital? You cut it because you obviously shot it on red eventually. Um, did you have the yeah, original? So, yeah. So some of the, so some of the files, um, some of the files were scanned in from the 35 mil uh, mm -hmm. negative. So that was something that um, uh, we have all the scans. Now we, we didn't have the, uh, the full reels, but we had enough to make some trims. Um, and then I had uh, the R3D files, so the raw red files. Um, and the the footage that I didn't have raw red files on, I had exported TIFF sequences. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's, uh, 
I was able to go back to the raw footage and you know regrade it and you know that that had that had been a really uh, you know fun fun experience really to go back and you know kind of be in a time capsule of sorts. And um, did you kind of look at your, you know, because you've obviously continued to edit and produce and direct, did you look at sequences and how you originally edited them and going, what's that shit? Did you, you know, look at the content and go, oh, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> I, like, honestly, I wish I had just like, you know, uh, an internal monologue, like where you're just like listening to my thoughts uh, so much. Like I was just like, uh, especially the editing. Um, on set, like I said, we were just trying to survive. So yeah. we, you know, we're able to, we were able to get some really great stuff, which was like, oh, wow. Like I, that's, that was difficult to get. That's difficult, difficult to get now, let alone back then. Right. Um, yeah. so I was like, oh, that, that was really great. But really it's the editing, really it's the editing and understanding, um, you know, the, how, how to move the story forward and you know, what you you know all those those moments that kind of add um, meat to it, but don't necessarily like if they're not it's not a hundred percent strong, then you can lose it. Um, like this version, I think, is almost twenty minutes shorter. So wow. it's, a, it's a it's a significant um, edit. Um, but it, you know what? Watching it now, I'm like, oh, that was the movie I should have released back then. The pace is so much faster, and it's it's much it's a much funner ride because yeah. it keeps going. Like, it's just, but like, I didn't, I didn't know how to kill my darlings back then. I didn't, I just, you know, and it's just like you, back then you're, you're, you're almost like, uh, you're a slave to actually have it fresh, the trauma fresh in your mind of shooting the movie. <laughs> and you're like, how could I possibly remove this when it took me so much and so much money to yeah. shoot it? Because that's it, that you that's know. Removed, because you know you have a you have a big set. You've got like you got the fog machines. You got the hay, you know, haze and all of that. And like I guess when you when you're working with a, a budget and you know you're fronting it or you know you're producing it and you're directing it, that you want to show everything. That you literally want to <laughs> show everything. That and then you look at you know the highest the bit you know the the most accomplished filmmakers. You know like you look at Ridley Scott. You know you, you know the scrolls in. There's, there's scrolls in, say, a kingdom of heaven on a table. And when you yeah. look at the production of that, the scrolls have got all designs, design stuff on. There's no, like, blank pages anywhere. So when you're producing something, and it's not being precious, is it? You just want to show the money on the screen? Yeah. Absolutely. I had a conversation. Um, what, uh, it was a conversation. It was like... It was, like a fight not really a fight but you know what i mean like a conversation yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, <laughs> you know and um uh he had uh for this movie night cries uh he had built this incredible uh, uh haitian hut right and i mean like the like this now the scene lasted maybe four minutes of screen time right like it's but the detail that my production designer put into it was incredible and when he watched the you know the movie he was disappointed that not a lot you know like you said the scrolls weren't shown yeah right yeah and and i understand that <laughs> i mean i understand wanting to show the work because for that time period like that's it that's that's his that's his painting right that's his art yeah and he you know is like oh i wish you were able to show a little bit more of this or a little bit more of this and uh like I, I there's a balance to that too like as an editor like I, the thing is is and you know now you know as an editor i'm a little more vicious right like you just got like well yep that's just the nature of what this this is and it's got to go if it doesn't serve the story so um but back you know back then i was very much like you said it's like i want to show people what we've you know what we've done and sometimes that's not the best idea <laughs> yeah. so. no, absolutely and you see that when you see making ofs of of certain films you see my god they they designed all of that they built all of that we only saw this and that's all you need to serve the story and that's you are serving the story story is paramount that is lost to a certain yeah. degree in a lot of projects that 
are you know they'll sh uh, remain nameless that are massive budgets and they don't really care about the story they just want to show a, a special effect or uh, um you know yeah something a spectacle and you know that's being lost and repercussions are happening box offices on those giant movies that have a giant budgets aren't doing as well now um and you've got to have an original original thought you know and story story is paramount like you say mm -hmm. um, i want to touch on a couple of films before we go before we finally wrap up with uh talking about sure. sick um where did the concept for baby stealer come from because that's something that's kind of close to me to a certain degree nothing to do with stealing a baby let's preface that but one yeah. of my one of my <laughs> neighbors i've got i'm sending her evil thoughts because she's a very horrible individual so where did <laughs> i'll rem <laughs> i won't say a name um but um uh, where did that kind of idea come from and the concept because it's a great idea and i love the observational uh, nature to it and you know, you could almost picture it from the other neighbors' point of view as well, and how they look out to everyone else. So, where did that kind of idea come from? Honestly, like the story of Baby Stiller is actually kind of—it's uh, kind of funny, and it shows you exactly how the film industry works. But in 2017, um, it was uh, disaster movies were really big. So, Andrew and I had a project um, called Super Isoclone that was written by Jake Helgren and Andrew had come up with the concept, and we were doing it with a company called Mar Vista. And um, as we were signing the deal, they called us and like, oh my God, disaster movies are dead, but thrillers and romances are in. So do you guys want to swap out this disaster deal? And we've got this movie, it was called, um, what was it called? Deadly View at the time, but it's baby, always oh, called Bedrest. It's called, yeah. it went then through it went to Deadly View, then it went to Baby Stealer. Anyways, so they actually had the script ready and then they also had Autumn Stables. So we swapped out the disaster movie for these two other um, films. And that's one was really... like the romance and one was a thriller. Yeah. And this was our first, we had done um, a country musical, which was another passion project at the mm -hmm. time already. But this was really our first foray into the business where it's the like business of like making money where we're yeah. like, you know what? We've, we have our passion projects. We need to figure out how to make money in this industry. So um, we had made a deal with that company and they were financing the project. So we're like, oh my God, we actually make movies where people can give us the money to do it. And yeah, Baby Stiller was one of them. And we, uh, we didn't know the genre that well at no, the time. No, I see, I was still, so we were just... I was still um, fighting my instincts of trying to make it like, you know, a Zodiac style, like, you know, a David Fincher movie, but that's not what, it, it, Baby Stealer was a title that came later, right? It was like, you know a deadly view where it was almost like and yeah. and I, I feel like i struggled um with specifically that movie tr to try to find the right tone because i had not done a thriller in the um that in that world yeah right so um you know that that movie again a, a learning experience where it's like i think we did a, 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 we pulled off a, a great job and sarah Minich is she's great amazing. and she's a she's you know, amazing a nutter yeah. Yeah. in the um, yeah. in the movie um and uh yeah it's like that was a that was the thing it's like okay you do that you learn and you're like okay i get the the genre now of that because everything is genres right like it's very specific to the you know any genre has the specific style so yeah um, but it was a lot of fun to do yeah. we had a great time doing uh baby Stiller and, and we got lucky that it got picked up by lifetime yeah so yeah yeah it's uh it's a fun one and like set like i mentioned sarah before that um was there any kind of um oh God, this is gonna sound really cheesy star trek chemistry between her and patrick when you worked on rock to pussy because they both on discovery quite extensively weren't they yeah i you know what the thing with those two is they're just such great actors like working with both of them i remember like the scenes that i would have with them i was like oh man like they're just so great they're just really talented. They're very, they're very they're... different. Like in their, um, like Sarah is very uh, prepared. Yeah. All the time, um, and uh, and Patrick really connects. Like he's yeah, very. Uh, she's very inquisitive, and Patrick is very, co like connects directly with whoever he's acting yeah. with very easily. Um, they didn't have many scenes together though. So, no, both like, very they're just very good friends. So yeah. it, was, it was such a good time working with that. That group of people like everybody on rock to pussy just got along great and uh 
Yeah. It was, yeah. It was, it was probably it was one, one of the best uh, experiences on a film set was Rock the Pussy, for sure. Yeah. Was, and, um, and Sarah's hilarious I think you can, in Rock the Pussy. I think you can sense that from when you go in, when I go, you know, go into research kind of things to uh, ask you guys and you get a sense of that i think from you can see the development of the directing performances and and kind of uh what you've been kind of going towards you know in your kind of both respective uh, respective careers and uh brigitte what's when you work on um a film like this and uh, other projects from an from an actor's point of view what's um are you are you constantly uh, kind of learning from other actors um not about yeah. increasing your your skills but what's that like from a from from someone that wouldn't know anything about this when you see other actors of you know high caliber or some that's just starting out are you always kind of learning from them or is it something you kind of go to classes Absolutely. for more or like the thing I love most in life is acting and like I go to acting class every week even though I've been an actor for 30 years because I just I enjoy the process of learning and you do you learn so much from other actors like I remember like with Sarah specifically I'm like she's she's just so talented and she's so prepared um and there's something about her that I, I was like oh my gosh I, I I love how she attack like attacks her roles and her you know, and you see her in um, Baby Stealer, Stealer versus Rocktopussy, and it's two completely different characters. And she knocks them both out of the park, um, you know? And same with Patrick, like Patrick had a way of just connecting where I was like, oh, this is really interesting because when I was acting with Patrick, he was my best friend, you know what I mean? Like I felt like Cam and Hunter were best friends and every time we were on set together, it just clicked. Um, and yeah, like he, acting, nobody ever stops learning. You know, it's it's one of those things where it's such a, a complicated art. Um, and I know some people are like, oh, I can act. I want to be an actor. But it's like you have to study for years to even start to understand. You know, it's like when we went back to Medium Raw, looking at it, that was one of my first real performances. And it's like looking at it 18 years later or however long, you're just <laughs> like, oh, man, I wish I knew now, you know, I knew then what I know now. Um, and have yeah. the opportunity to do those scenes with those incredible actors. Because at the time, I was just nervous. You know, like I remember being in the in the scene with William B. Davis, and I was shaking. Like I was like, I just need to get through my lines. <laughs> you know. Um, and today it would be just such like such a different experience. It would be so much fun to be able to be in a room with him and and do that same scene. You know, because you just you just keep growing. Yeah. Yeah, I am. I, um, I'm I'm just thinking about that. Uh... Yeah, and, and those nerves must be... You must, are you still nervous acting? It depends. If it's our stuff, I'm not, just because I feel very comfortable on our sets. But if we were to bring in, like, there's certain actors that um, I could see myself definitely being nervous. Like, I, I took a class with um, an acting coach that I wanted to learn from 20 years ago. And I was like, his name is David Rotenberg. He's incredible. And I was like, I finally got into one of his classes and I remember walking into the class and I was like, oh my gosh, I haven't felt nervous in a really long time. Like it takes a lot for me to get nervous in life. And I walked in and I felt like that 18 year old kid that just wanted to impress him, you know? So I think there's definitely situations yeah. where the nerves will pop up. Um, but on our sets, like I love it because it's very comfy and, you know, you feel like you can explore and have fun. And um, are you guys looking forward to being part of Sick? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It'll be our first time. Uh, well, it's the second year of Sick, right? Yeah. So um, yeah, yeah they've been fun. great so far. I'm really excited to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they've been very hospitable. Um, I'm excited. Yeah, and my hometown is Sudbury, so I'm uh, I get to go back home for this, which will be great. I haven't been to Sudbury in a that's, while. That's awesome, and. Um, so what what are you guys doing there? Is it a Q and A after the showing of Rock to Pussy? What's the kind of what what are you guys get involved with? Yeah, I mean we've got the screening and then a Q and A, and then on the Saturday, um, I'm doing a couple panels. Andrew's doing a panel, and we're on doing a production and distribution, and then yeah. you're doing a panel on women in film. Uh, yeah, or women, women in, in horror, horror films. films. Yeah. Um, and then we've got a photo op and we've got a table where we'll be selling some, you know, some fun merch, like we've got t-shirts and posters and calendars and 
Yeah, all sorts of stuff. All sorts of fun and stuff. That, and that fridge, the fridge, the fridge I've seen. <gasps> yeah, it's so pretty cool. cool. We had no idea they were doing that. I guess it's a, a lot of it has been very surprising to us as well. Where they'll, yeah. like, they'll show us more stuff. I'm like, wow, that's great. That's really cool. Yeah. I'm like, I want to yeah, put my name um, in, that, <laughs> in that fridge. Um, Doug, Doug's Doug's fantastic. The organizer, Doug, he's he's absolute. Uh, he kind of helped me put you know put me in touch with you guys and um, one or two yeah. other filmmakers that I really admire. Like I'm I'm going to be interviewing. Um, a bunch of other the other actors and and producers and filmmakers associated with sick uh and then um i don't know if you've seen the film cube or uh, cypher um the director of that will cube, be speaking yeah. to you speaking to in a few weeks time so yeah i want to shout out to doug uh the organizer as as a, a little thank you for um just kind of hooking this up and it's been an absolute pleasure to speak and see both both of you guys you too thank you so much for taking the time yeah, great. Thank you. And uh, thankfully, it's not not a crazy time um, because it's only quarter past ten in the evening here, so it's uh, it's nothing nothing cra okay, <laughs> still chaotic. Still early. Yeah, still early. Yeah, mm -hmm. I might even like I can see in the background. I might even go and stick on aliens or something now. Uh, we, honestly, <laughs> I just watched it a week and a half ago. It's a, it's still incredible. Yeah still incredible it all it all stands up it all stands up doesn't it uh but thank you uh, uh brigitte yeah. and andrew it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to both of you and uh, uh please keep in touch i'll i'll send out on social media especially instagram uh the clips and i've i'll put a little post together today you'll you might see on instagram showing who the future who the the new guests are and including you guys as well awesome thank you so much amazing thank you all right see you all soon bye-bye Okay, bye.